Good, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Matthew Walker. He's a professor of neuroscience and psychology at UC Berkeley, formerly from Harvard. He's the director of the Human Sleep Science Laboratory and a sleep scientist also at Google. Very interested in all of this. Welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to start with testicles. Men who sleep five hours a night have significantly smaller testicles than those who sleep seven hours or more. In addition, men who routinely sleep just five to six hours a night will have a level of testosterone which is that of someone 10 years their senior. So a lack of sleep will age you by a decade in terms of that critical aspect of wellness and virility. And we see equivalent impairments in female reproductive health caused by insufficient sleep. This is probably the best news that I have for you today. Not only am I going to tell you about the wonderfully good things that happen when you get sleep, I'll tell you about the alarmingly bad things that happen when you don't get enough. I will describe a new method for a new electrical uh, augmentation method for the enhancement of human sleep, a new electroceutical. And finally, I hope that we finish realizing that sleep may be the ultimate biological operating system, not only for extending lifespan, but also extending health span. So let me start with sleep and the brain. What we've discovered over the past 10 years is that you need sleep after learning to essentially hit the save button on those new memories so that you don't forget. So sleep will future-proof that information. But recently we've discovered that you also need sleep before learning, but now to prepare your brain, almost like a dry sponge, ready to initially soak up new information. And without sleep, the memory circuits within the brain essentially become waterlogged, as it were, and you can't absorb new information. Let me show you the data. So here in this study, we decided to test the hypothesis that pulling the all-nighter was a good idea. How do you do that? We took a group of healthy adults and we assigned them to either a sleep group or a sleep deprivation group. Now the sleep group, they're going to get a full eight hours of shut eye, but the deprivation group, we're going to keep them awake in the laboratory under full supervision. Um, no naps, no caffeine, it's miserable for everyone. And then the next day, we're going to place those participants inside an MRI scanner. And we're going to have them try and learn a whole list of new facts as we're taking snapshots of brain activity and then we're going to test them to see how effective that learning has been. And that's what you're looking at here on the vertical axis. So when you put those two groups head to head, what you find is a quite significant 40% deficit in the ability of the brain to make new memories without sleep. I think this should be frightening considering what we know is happening to sleep in our education populations right now, just as we heard from Raphael. To put that in context, it would be the difference between acing an exam and failing it miserably. And it's why I was um, so fortunate and passionate um, when I spoke uh, with the doctor, uh, sorry, um, Governor Brown's office on Thursday to try and implore him to sign this law in place. It will be a staggering feat for the improvement of human education from this point forward, at least in California. Now, we've not only learned how sleep impacts your learning behavior, but also what goes wrong within the brain to produce those types of learning deficiencies or learning disabilities. There is a structure that sits on the left and the right side of your brain called the hippocampus. And you can see it here in these sort of orange colors. Think of the hippocampus like the informational inbox of your brain in that it's very good at receiving new memory files and holding on to them. And when we looked at this structure in those people who'd had a full night of sleep here in green, we saw lots of healthy learning related activity. Yet in those people who were sleep deprived, we actually couldn't find any significant signal whatsoever. It's almost as though sleep deprivation had shut down the memory inbox and any new incoming files, they were just being bounced. You couldn't effectively commit new experiences to memory. So that's the bad that happens if I were to take sleep away. But let me just come back to that control group here in green. Do you remember those folks that got a full eight hours of sleep? 
Well, we can ask a very different question here. What is it about the physiological quality of your sleep when you do get it that amplifies and enhances your memory and learning ability each and every day? And by placing dense array electrodes all over the head, what we've discovered is that there are big, powerful brain waves that happen during the very deepest stages of sleep that have riding on top of them these spectacular bursts of electrical activity that we call sleep spindles. And it's the combined quality of these deep sleep brain waves and the timing of them that act like a file transfer mechanism at night, shifting memories from a short-term vulnerable reservoir to a more permanent, safe, long-term storage uh, haven within the brain. And it's important that we understand, by the way, mechanistically and physiologically, what actually transacts these memory benefits because there are real medical and societal implications. And let me just tell you about one area that we've moved this work out into, which is the context of aging and dementia. Because I think many of us understand that as we get older, our learning and memory abilities begin to fade and decline. But what we've also known for many decades now is that a physiological signature of aging is that your sleep gets worse, especially that deep quality of sleep that I was just discussing. And only last year, we finally published evidence that these two things are not simply co-occurring. They are significantly interrelated. It suggests that the disruption of deep sleep is an underappreciated factor that is contributing to what we call cognitive decline in aging, and most recently we've discovered in Alzheimer's disease as well. Now, I know this is remarkably depressing news, but there's a possible silver lining here. Unlike many of the other factors that we know are associated with aging and dementia, sleep is a modifiable target. It's a potential treatment route. And we have since, or I should say I've since, um, developed a, uh, a new startup company called Stim Science, and we're actually developing a method based on this. It's uh, called direct current brain stimulation. You insert a small amount of voltage into the brain, so small that you typically tend not to feel it, but it has a measurable impact. Now, if we apply this electrical stimulation during sleep in young, healthy adults, as if you're sort of singing in time with those deep sleep brain waves, not only can you amplify the size of those deep sleep brain waves, but in doing so, you can almost double the amount of memory benefit that you get from sleep. The question now is whether we can translate the same affordable, potentially portable piece of technology into older adults and those with dementia. Can we restore back some healthy quality of deep sleep? And in doing so, can we salvage aspects of learning and memory function? That is our real hope now. And that's one of our sort of moonshot goals, as it were. And I should also note, by the way, that we've just uh, got preliminary data demonstrating that we can reverse engineer this trick and we can actually amplify wakefulness under the pressure of insufficient sleep. And we're doing that for circumstances where cognitive acumen is essential, but sleep deprivation is rife. Contexts such as medicine, aviation, as well as the military. So that's sleep for um, learning, memory, aging, and Alzheimer's. What else is sleep potentially useful for? Let me tell you that sleep is essential to help stabilize your emotional and mental health. And without sleep, the emotional circuits of the brain can become hyperactive and irrational. Um, allow me to demonstrate with a sleep-deprived subject because it turns out that we do video diaries with our participants throughout these deprivation nights, and you go to meet one under the pseudonym of Jeff. Um, Jeff has just entered the study. It's 11.30 at night on day one. He's been awake for a perfectly normal 16 hours, and let's hear from Jeff what his um, sort of hopes and aspirations are for the deprivation period. Hello, it's about 11.27 right now. Um, I've been here for about an, uh, I think about an hour, no, yeah, about an hour, so it's the first hour. Um, I'm writing my paper right now, a uh, 30-page paper. Hopefully I can get some of it done before I get too sleepy. So that's Jeff, perfectly likable, affable chap who's hoping to get his 30-page report complete in a night of sleep deprivation. 
classic delusional undergraduate thinking, I have to say. I see it all of the time in my students. Now let's fast forward the clock. It's now 5.30 the following morning. Um, Jeff has now been awake for 22 hours straight, and instantly you'll notice one of the hallmark features of sleep deprivation, which is that you slide down in your chair. Um, just look around the, the room uh, right now. Jeff's down about six inches here now. It's about an inch for every hour that you've been awake beyond the standard 16, um, based on our highly sophisticated machine learning algorithms. Um, but in all seriousness, notice how emotionally different Jeff has become. Some people have, I think, rather unkindly described him as becoming a little bit emotionally unhinged. So let's hear from Jeff how that 30-page report has been going. Um, and I do apologize ahead of time for the um, profanity. Hello. I'm very angry right now. Because I didn't get any fucking, but can I curse on this? I think I'm like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> They really think I'm crazy. I'm very lucid, actually. So did you notice how Jeff went from being remarkably upset and annoyed that he'd got none of his 30-page report complete to then finding it almost hilarious? He was nearly punch drunk, giddy on sleep deprivation, and came right back down to baseline again. That is a remarkably abnormal emotional distance to travel within such a short time period. And I think it emphasizes the type of destabilizing influence that a lack of sleep has on our emotional integrity. And we've gone on to uncover what changes within the brain to produce this type of pendulum-like emotional irrationality. And there's a structure that sits deep within the brain called the amygdala. And it's one of the centerpiece regions for the generation of strong emotional reactions. And when we looked at this structure in those people who'd had a full night of sleep here in green, we saw a nice, controlled, modest degree of reactivity. Yet in those people who were sleep deprived, we saw this amplified, almost aggravated degree of reactivity. Almost as though without sleep, we become all emotional gas pedal and too little regulatory control break. What was more concerning to me, however, was that this represented a neurological signature that was not dissimilar to several psychiatric conditions. And we're now finding significant links between sleep disruption and disorders such as depression, anxiety, including PTSD, schizophrenia, and most recently and tragically, suicide as well. In fact, we have not been able to discover a single major psychiatric condition in which sleep is normal. So I think sleep has a profound story to tell in our understanding, our treatment, maybe even ultimately our prevention of grave mental illness. But where does this leave us? What is the piece of mental furniture that I would like to gift to you at the end of this talk? Well, it would be this. Sleep, unfortunately, is not an optional lifestyle luxury. Sleep is a non-negotiable biological necessity. It is a life support system, and it is Mother Nature's best effort yet at immortality. And with that, I will simply say good night, good luck, and above all, I do hope you sleep well. Thank you very much indeed.